Joined by my guest, he is journalist and author Peter Lloyd. The Twitter handle is Suffra Gentleman. And the book, which I've read, which you can see right here, is Stand By Your Manhood. Peter, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Paul. Good to chat. Good to have you. Now, before we get into it, we're going to play your greatest hit to date, which is when you triggered a feminist on Sky News. And we're going to talk about what happened after that. Let's roll this. This, this is Peter triggering a feminist on Sky News. Here it is. Get one final thought from you. Are there words that are used to describe men that offend you? Uh, not particularly, and, and if, if there were some I don't like, I certainly wouldn't want them banned. But it go, do you know, it always goes back to that old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but there will always be something to offend a feminist. Peter Lloyd. Well, that, no, that's just obnoxious, Peter Lloyd, sorry. You have, to, you have to give me a I, chance I we'll to respond to that. That discussion. is ridiculous. That, no, hang on, I won't do your show again if you don't let me respond go to on, that. Go on, Kate, have a word. Come on, that's ridiculous. I mean, that, first of all, that... Like... <laughs> she won't do the Imagine... show again, oh, God forbid. Imagine my shock when she reacted that way, Paul. <laughs> it's funny how she said, oh, I'm not, not going to do your show again. Well, how is that a bad thing? I'm going to read out some statistics now, though. I'm going to get your response to this, you know, getting into why masculinity has been denigrated so much in the popular culture. I retweeted this mm. a couple of days ago, and I think these stats are out of America, but, you know, they're, they're probably common across the board. OK, deaths yeah. in battle, men, 97 percent, women, 2.3 percent. Homelessness, men, 62%, women, 38%. Suicides, men, 77%, women, 22%. Homicides, men, 77%, women, 22%. Workplace deaths, 93% men, 7% women. College graduates, and these numbers are getting worse on a, on a yearly basis, men, 40%, women, 60%. Women are doing better in education more and more. Winners of custody, which is a big subject of your book, Men, 17.8%, women, 82.2%. Now, Peter, the first line of your book is men are brilliant. Shia LaBeouf once said a few years ago that masculinity was a synonym for a-hole. Why do you think we see in the culture now this relentless attempt through advertising, uh, through pop culture to denigrate, demonize and shame men and masculinity in general? What's the agenda behind it? Well, I take no joy in saying it, but I, I really think it is third wave feminism. I think that is that is the cause of the problem. That is the root of the problem. What was considered radical, you know, fringe man hating back in the 1970s when feminism was still pretty much in its infancy uh, in, in terms of being mainstream. Uh, you know, this, this stuff was, was rare, but it's now become very, very mainstream. And it's also become very lucrative for a lot of companies, especially advertising companies. So what's happened is it's just almost built up a cumulative effect. And now it's this great big juggernaut that has huge political sway, it has huge commercial sway. Uh, and increasingly, more and more people are buying into it. And you have graduates of the movement, graduates of the feminist movement, who are growing up with this mindset that men are the enemy, that women are victims. And then these people are taking that mindset into the workplace. So, so they're graduating university, they've probably done a degree in gender studies, and then they're going into an industry such as advertising or the media um, or, or, you know, or, or government policy, and they're implementing issues and ideas based on those political beliefs, which for the most part aren't rooted in reality. So they, this is why we've seen it become so pervasive in the last couple of years. And I mean, I think everyone will agree that we've reached almost a saturation point now with the level of misandry and man bashing which we see on a daily basis. Which is, you know, there's a, there's a backlash to that, again, from women who, feminism basically has become a pejorative. It's, it's become a dirty word because of the behavior of the third wave radicals. We're gonna get onto that in a, in a second here, but I just wanted to read some of this article because it's a new art, article out of Campus Reform. Professor says feminists have every right to hate men. Now, this is a, mm. a professor from Northeastern University, director of women's gender and sexuality studies. Imagine my shock. She demands <laughs> that men step away because, quote, we have every right to hate you. And this was in the uh, Washington Post. This was an op-ed. She said, so in this moment here in the land of legislatively legitimized toxic masculinity, is it really so illogical to hate men? Now she goes on to say, and this is quite honest, I, I found, because most, most feminists will deny that it's about man hating. They'll deny that it's about the lust for power. I've said many yeah. times behind most social justice causes, you will find a, a raw lust for power. 
She said this about men, quote, lean out so we can actually just stand up without being beaten down, pledge to vote for feminist women only, don't run for office, don't be in charge of anything, step away from the power. So there you have an honest feminist, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day, a truthful feminist, a professor admitting that it's about man hatred and the lust for power. So they're actually starting to admit it now, Peter. Absolutely. And I think actually they've always really admitted it. This kind of dialogue, this kind of conversation and opinion has always been very, very common. It's always been at the core of the movement. Um, the, the only difference with this is I think you know, she's uh, obviously a professor at university, so she works, moves in academic circles where this kind of, you know, this, this kind of opinion is, is tolerated, if not celebrated. And so I think she probably got a rude awakening when she published this in the press and got some flack for it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's absolutely startling that this is somebody who teaches university students about the world. I mean, this is absolutely terrifying. If ever there was proof of how rigged the educational system is, that is it. Uh, although, although it did kind of make me laugh because the woman who who uh, wrote the article, I believe, I believe she's she's gay, um, I, and I tweeted back to her and I said, you know, with all due respect, you're really not doing much to dispel the image of a man hating lesbian. <laughs> no, I mean that's I made that point on Twitter over and over again. Whenever I think there was a Lena Dunham quote a few days ago where. She was, she was like, if, if ever a man tells me not to, not to do something, I'll do it or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But again, it, it was just lashing out at men. I made the point, oh, feminism's not about man hating, really. So they, they can't just they can't help themselves. As he said, there's no real attempt to hide it anymore. But if you want to talk about toxic masculinity, which they often do, there is a very virulent form, I believe, of toxic masculinity, which is beginning to impose mm. itself more and more on the West. And that is. Mm. Islamism in a, in a broader context. We've got this irony of feminists. I don't know if you've seen the clip out of Germany. It was about a year ago of feminists at an anti-Trump march, literally getting up and shouting Allah Akbar, making an alliance with Islamists. The most anti-woman, absolutely toxic, genuinely toxic, aggressively patriarchal belief system on the planet in, it, in its purest form. So we've got the irony of, you know, feminists making alliances with Islam, the most patriarchal belief system in the world. Jordan Peterson's talked about this uh, in one of his mm. shows. Do you think that's kind of a way of compensating for the fact that masculinity, masculinity, masculinity has been eroded so much in the West that they see the need to kind of still have it in place, but just to, so they can make alliances with Islam because, you know, the, the left uses Islam, they use Muslims as human shields for their, for their own argument. So is there need, a need to compensate for it by still clinging on to that patriarchal belief system, but having it even more toxic, even more um, aggressive and misogynistic? What, how do we explain this, this absolutely baffling alliance between feminism and Islamism? Mm, I mean, it's such a fascinating subject. And actually, until Jordan Peterson uh, re referenced this and mooted it as a potential motivator, uh, you know, for why the you know, left feminism has, has uh, kind of adopted Islam, I'd never really thought about it. But, you know, it, it certainly seems to resonate. There certainly seems to be some degree of logic there. I mean, any evolutionary psychologist will tell you that women's drive to mate with dominant males is, is absolutely steeped in nature. Uh, you, you, know, you only have to look at the commercial success of Fifty Shades of Grey, I believe. You know, incredulously, it's the best-selling book in the world ever. Um, I mean, obviously, the subject matter of that you know, was kind of testified to what we're saying here, is that there is some kind of subconscious interest in women being consensually controlled by men. And I think it's so subconscious that you know, even the suggestion of it is alien to them, and of course it triggers them to the point of of, of utter meltdown. But uh, you know, I would be very, very surprised if there wasn't some degree of that, uh, you know, in the reason for them being kind of so supportive of this of this religion, which is clearly misogynistic. I mean, I'm I'm not a fan of feminism, uh, not a fan of third wave feminism, but I certainly believe that you know women's rights are important and that equal opportunity is key for any civilized society. And if anywhere in the world needs female emancipation, it's in, you know, it's, it's in the East where this religion dominates. 
So I mean, it's so ironic that uh, you know that we hear all the time about you know the war on terror and and fighting Al Qaeda. Blimey, I think we need to start worrying about Gal Qaeda and all these shihadists who kind of are aligning themselves with people like Linda Sarso, who's an absolute. I mean, what are they? What are they thinking? Maybe they're just. Uh, maybe they've been completely snowed by her PR spin, and maybe they believe, you know, well, she's a woman. You know, she's a Muslim. She, you know, she considers herself a feminist. So if she is part of that religion and, she, and, she, and my political ideology, then I can also be part of it too. Well, completely ignoring the disconnect in logic, which is at its core. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Again, it's about the role us for power, and they know that it's easier to use Muslims or any kind of minority group as a kind of human shield for their own arguments. So when the, you attack their arguments, now you're attacking Muslims. Now you're attacking a minority right. group. Now that they've adopted the hijab as the symbol of the resistance, we saw that with the anti-Trump resistance posters. Now when you attack these anti-Trump lunatics, you're not attacking them, you're attacking precious minority group. So again, they don't really care about the, the rights of these people. They're openly supporting a modesty culture which oppresses women. Again, it's about power. It's about using them as a human shield for their own discredited arguments. Meanwhile, as he said, you know, we've got we've got Taharush Gamia, which is a, literally means the rape game in Middle Eastern countries, which has been imported yeah. to this country to a great extent with the grooming gangs. Um, and yet still we have, as you mentioned, this kind of biological need, not really not really to be dominated for women, but just to have some kind of overarching patriarchal structure, which tends to uh, align itself with natural biological gender roles for men and women, which have worked successfully uh, for, you know, civilizations. Now they're right. being eroded. Yeah. And now we see this this kind of alliance with Islamism as a kind of ridiculous, uh, aggressive replacement for that. But as you said, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey, most popular book, they whine about rape culture. And then they go out and buy Fifty Shades in, in their droves. They watch it at the cinema. Um, you can look at polls, not to get too deeply into this because it's a family show, but <laughs> it's something like 66% of women have rape fantasies. So this is this is just a reality. And then they point the finger at like poor 18-year-old kids in college and say that these college uh, campuses are uh, rape culture breeding grounds. It's completely BS. The, the cases have fallen apart over and over again. They're ruining people's yeah. lives. And there was a stat, actually, Peter, which was, and I'm going to get in, on, into the whole Me Too thing, which I saw a stat, I think it was a, a study, a survey out of The Economist. They found that 25% of millennial men in the United States thought that asking a woman out for a drink was a form of sexual harassment. So, so these young kids have been so terrified so eroded of their masculinity, so under assault for so long that they literally think asking a woman out for a drink or just asking her to buy her a drink is a form of sexual harassment. Meanwhile, you know, the rape gangs are being imported, absolute complete disconnect. It's completely absurd. We're going to get onto the Me Too stuff in a second here, though. I want to look at marriage, though, because we've got mm. these stats. And again, these these will vary from country to country, but generally speaking, around 20% of Americans aged 18 to 29 are married. Now, bear in mind that Americans, from my experience, are more prone, more eager to get married at a younger age than people in definitely the UK and other European countries. But you compare that mm. stat, 20% of Americans aged 18 to 29 are married now. That's That was 59% back in 1960. So first of all, what do you think are the main reasons for that change? And then in your book, which I've read, you actually advise men, which this may uh, contradict with our, some of our Christian audience, but you actually advise men not to get married. So why do you think those numbers have changed so much? And why do you advise men, generally speaking, not to get married? Well, I think there's a, a, a kind of combination of factors, reason, uh, you know, for, for that kind of free fall in, in marriage rates. I think part of it is that there's been, at least here in the UK, there's been a bit of a decline in religion. I think there's probably also less respect for traditional family values. Um, but also, previously, historically, men married because it was a way of getting sex. And now, you know, the, the, the economies of, of, of men and women and the sexual marketplace, it's changed dramatically. Now, 
you know, you don't need to be married to have sex. There's no stigma in having sex outside of outside of, of marriage or even outside of a committed relationship. So the incentives for marriage are no longer there. And also it can be dissolved so easily. So it, it's it's really seen as, as a bit of a, an indulgence. And uh, but I also think that there's an extra layer to that, specifically with men, which is seeing them opt out of marriage. They're almost on a marriage strike. And I actually think it's very wise. I mean, we hear all the time about how men aren't very good with commitment, uh, you know, and, and how they run away from it. And actually, it's wise for men to run from marriage because marriage, however you dress it up, whatever, whatever the romantic element to it, it is a legally binding contract. And men need to consider it in the same way they would consider a business contract because time and time again, Marriages have ended in divorce, and it's men who've ended up being the financial underwriters for their wives, sometimes for the rest of their lives. And there are huge risks involved with men marrying. I mean, the financial impact is bad enough, but then you also have to factor in you know, the fact that you would probably lose your home. If you have children, you probably won't get custody. You probably won't even get access to them. You'll be forced to fund them, but you won't get access to them. Uh, you know, and uh, plus you've got to stump up two rings, an engagement and a marriage ring. What is the incentive to do that when it could all easily go wrong? Uh, so, so men are, you know, wising up. The penny is slowly dropping that marriage is a raw deal or, as I call it, the fraud of the rings. Uh, and I'm really I'm really I'm really pleased to see that happen because I'm so tired of watching men get absolutely roasted in divorce courts. I mean, only here in the UK in the last couple of weeks, there was a case. I think he was a 75 year old man who was jailed for I mean, he, he was he was being objectionable. He was obstructing part of his ex-wife's divorce jackpot. But um, I mean, she still got a very generous sum. And he was I think he was just trying to to stop her being given the title to his business, which he founded or something like that. And so the judge actually jailed him. Now, you have to see this in context because we have cases where women, young women can go on Tinder dates and stab their partner and they aren't sent to jail. So, you know, the, the family court system, the divorce courts do not treat men kindly. And so what I say, you know, when I encourage men not to marry like I do in the book, it's not because I don't have a respect for kind of what can be achieved and accomplished in marriage. My parents are still together. They've recently celebrated 50 years. Um, you know, my three elder sisters are all successfully married. Uh, so I can appreciate that it's a good thing and it's a solid foundation for, for a society. But really, I, I tell men not to marry because I want, them to, I want them to safeguard themselves from these potential risks. Invest in long-term relationships, have healthy relationships, you know, treat each other with respect, but do not sign a contract that is going to make you liable for huge sums of money and emotional pain. Yeah, and you point to some of these examples in the book, mainly with celebrities who get absolutely rinsed because they don't have a proper prenup. And in some cases, not just with celebrities, I think you mentioned a couple of cases like this in the book. Men get men's partners, they get divorced from their from their wives. The wife gets remarried to someone else. In some cases, he doesn't even have access to his own kids. Yeah, he's still paying alimony, he's still paying divorce payments. When she's already remarried, in some cases she's yeah. earning more money than him, and he doesn't even have access to the kids, but he's still paying her a monthly alimony payment. In some cases, that's absolutely incredible. Is this is this kind of swung back in the favour of men over the past few years after the attention, you know, in this country from Fathers for Justice? Has it has the balance of power swung back a little bit in men's favour and in the favour of justice and fairness, or is it still as bad as it ever was before, in your view? It's it's still as bad as it ever was. I mean, Fathers for Justice, I think, are a wonderful grassroots organisation, and, and you know, I consider them the, the modern day male version of the of the suffragettes in many ways. Um, and then they did a wonderful job of putting the issue on the map and you know it, introducing it in, into the narrative. But it's really done absolutely nothing. Nothing has changed legislatively in the past ten or, or you know fifteen years. You know, the, the family court system is still conducted in almost complete and utter secrecy. I cannot tell you how many male celebrities, really famous men, have contacted me and you know, spoken in depth about how their equally famous partners 
have denied them access to their children or exactly. really Hold that thought. We got one quick break. We'll be right back. We'll be live with Peter Lloyd. Stand by your manhood is the book. Don't go away. We are back live on the Deep State special 34 hour broadcast. We're talking to Peter Lloyd. He is an author and journalist. The Twitter handle is Suffra Gentleman and the book is Stand By Your Manhood. It's right here. I've read it. It's brilliant. Everyone needs to go out and get it. Peter, before the break, you were just finishing up a thought on celebrities who don't have proper prenup set up. They get absolutely rinsed in the divorce courts. In some cases, you know, their, their wives remarry. They have kids with other people and they get, mm. they get rinsed forevermore until their dying day. Just finish off your thought on that. Yeah. So I was just saying how, you know, I've been contacted by numerous celebrities, some of them very, very well known, you know, who, who've explained to me, you know, did this process and the pain they're going through and that they're not allowed to see their children and that they've been forced out of the family home and that they're having to pay huge sums of money every month in maintenance, which is insane. Uh, and the message I always get from it is, look, no matter how rich and powerful and well connected and famous you are, this, it, it doesn't matter. The system is well and truly rigged whether you're a man at the top of the you know the echelons or if you're at the bottom the system is rigged in women's favor and i, I always say you know women don't don't flat the system because they're women you know they do this because they have the upper hand uh, you know, and that's one, one of the reasons why i'm always so keen for you know in, in the division of a marriage where there are children i want there to be an assumed 50 50 shared parenting uh, kind of starting point so, so that no parent has to fight for at least equal access to their own child. I mean, you know, they can modify that however they want, depending on, you know, whatever their lifestyles and professions are like. But, uh, you know, in the future, I really want parents to have an initial starting point of 50-50. How on earth can we be in 2018 and, and, and almost 95% of, or something, 90% of, of custody cases go in the women's favor? That, that's insane. That's not gender equality. It's absolutely incredible, and it's contributing to the suicide statistics to at least a small extent amongst men, because of course this causes depression. Men are cut off from their kids; they have no way of getting them back. They're rinsed over and over again in the courts, and you know that leads to mental illness, leads to depression, leads to suicide, which is again a massive problem amongst men, as we've seen with with the figures and with many high case profiles of that recently. Talking about the uh, the incel movement now, though, I made a video: the truth about incels. Of course, we had the MGTOW movement, which is men going their own way. Now we've got this kind of edgier vibe to it. In some cases, it's turned violent. This is involuntary celibate. So talking about young men who are trying to get dates, they're trying to attract women. They haven't gone their own way in a sense like the MGTOWs. Several mm. recently have turned to violence because of their frustration. At least that's according to the media narrative. Do you think this whole incel rebellion is a real concern or is it an, a contrived moral panic whipped up by the media and you know who's to blame for all this well i think it's definitely the latter i think it's definitely something of a media panic uh you know of course these people are just mentally ill they're just deranged and they have access to weapons or whatever you know it, it, it's not simply down to their masculinity and what always makes me laugh is how the media sees on this these few like a very incredibly small minority of men who do this i think i can count them on one hand you know in, in the last couple of years uh that they are representative of what masculinity means and it proof that you know that, that we are in free fall and that, and that we have a toxicity to us um which is the exact inverse of the message they have when they're talking about muslims when there is a radical terrorist running around shouting Allah akbar so uh, i always laugh at the inconsistency in the message when these kind of cases are reported i mean of course each individual case is very sad it's very tragic and it's very frustrating but it's not representative of the real world. And it's not representative of, I mean, most teenagers I know are not having sex. They want it, but they're not having it yet. Um, and the overwhelming majority of them are not going around being violent. Uh, so I, I think we really need to try and keep this in, in, in perspective uh, and not let the media kind of fan these flames of it being you know, symptomatic of, of a root cause where, where we're kind of, we've defaulted. It's, it's just not true. Now, in, in terms of, you know, MGTOW and incels, do you think we're getting better in terms of gender relations, whereby young men are finding it easier to get dates with the rise of Tinder and all these dating apps? Or, 
you know, given how masculin masculinity is under assault, how they're being told <laughs> in the case I drew attention to uh, asking a woman, asking him to buy a woman a drink is a form of sexual harassment. Do you see young men being more terrified, feeling more alienated, feeling more atomized, feeling more nervous about approaching women? Or do you think the whole the whole hookup culture, for better or worse, is actually helping them out in, in that sense? I think probably both at the same time, but uh, you know, certainly the way men are spoken about, the way masculinity is spoken about, the way particularly straight male sexuality, male heterosexuality, the way that's spoken about, you know, with such venom and such hate and such fear, you know, it, it's internalizing something in, in young men, which is triggering, I hate to use that word, but it, it's used in the proper context there. It's triggering something in their minds, which is forcing them to react this way. Um, and, and so I really believe that part of the problem behind it is this narrative that we have all the time that, that men are at fault, that no matter what men do, it's going to be wrong, that you know, any interest in women is sexual harassment and it's misogynistic. That is certainly not helping. Uh, and it's certainly not going to improve things for, for people who are, are kind of victims of these crimes and stuff. So, uh, you know, I think if we changed how we spoke about men, it would, it would be very different. We wouldn't dream of speaking about Muslim people, the, more, the Muslim community, the way we speak about, about white straight men. Exactly. I mean, often there's an Islamic terror attack and they don't look at Islam as the cause. They blame toxic masculinity. So then I troll them and I say, well, you're saying that Muslims have toxic masculinity. Isn't that a little bit Islamophobic? So you can trip them up with their own, you know, tortured thought process there. But I want to talk about the Me Too movement. I made several videos about this. I've argued that third wave feminism in the culture has largely been discredited, at least in the culture, not at the educational level where it still runs rampant. But I've noticed, mm -hmm. you know, I noticed a big change since like 2013, 2014, when feminism was you know, kind of on top. Now, I mean, you talk to a lot of young women, you look at the polls, especially in this country, fewer and fewer women are identifying as feminists. It seems to have been discredited to some extent. But now we have the Me Too movement, which I've argued, argued is a kind of a attempt to rebrand third wave feminism. We, mm. We've had cases like Aziz Ansari, where he had consensual sex oh. with a woman and because she regretted it the next day. She tried to out him as a rampant misogynist. We've had uh, extremist feminists try to get this instituted into law where regret rape becomes a thing. Um, again, I mentioned the poll, 25% of US millennial men think asking to buy a woman a drink is a form of sexual harassment. What impact do you think Me Too is going to have on already fraught gender relations? And is it just a lame effort to rebrand feminism? Well, in response to your first question, it's certainly not going to do gender relations any favors. Uh, in fact, it's going to make things even worse. It, you know, if it was possible that things could get any worse, they, they really will do. Um, because increasingly, men are just being paralyzed by a fear of their own selves, you know, of their own innate sexuality, which is absolutely, and I stress this in the book, it's natural and healthy and normal. Uh, you know, most people, you know, most men do not commit sexual crimes. Most male sexuality is healthy and functional and nurturing. Uh, and, and so it's very sad for me to see Me Too be co-opted by the feminist movement. And I think that's what happened. I think Me, me Too, you know, had a legitimate start. You know, it, it came from calling out the, these kind of sex predators in, in Hollywood, et cetera. And then what happened was when it became very high profile, then feminists began to hijack it for their own political gain, which is, I mean, unfortunately, it's something that feminists have done from the beginning. I mean, they, they did a very similar thing with the domestic violence industry. It's a, a terrible term, but, but it's true. Um, uh, and so what they've done is they, they've now taken this, this movement uh, as, as proof that all men are evil and that all women are virtuous and victims. Uh, and I mean, I think it's, it, it's now reaching the point where there's almost going to be a point where someone something presses the reset button. There's going to be some kind of rebellion against it all. You know, there's almost going to be an anti-sexual revolution. I'm not sure quite how it's going to manifest, but uh, I mean, maybe it's going to be in 50 years when a lot of people end up lonely and childless and without families that, that they realize that there's been a huge, you know, a huge mistake made in how we interact with each other as, as men and women. So I, I always try and encourage men to take Me Too with a pinch of salt and not to internalize some of the guilt that 
you know, it's repeatedly put out there for us to ingest. It's, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a tough task. Well, again, I mean, I would argue that it's, it's again, eroding male dominance, you know, like natural male dominance. I think it, it will cause more men to be very nervous around girls and they're doing nothing wrong by approaching girls, by being confident. That's what girls want to hear. I mean, that's the ultimate aphrodisiac for women, isn't it? Confidence. And we're telling young men, we're telling boys growing up that you shouldn't have that kind of dominant confidence, which isn't aggressive, which isn't overbearing. It's just the natural male way of behaving. And we're, we're in trying to indoctrinate that out of young men. That's going to be a disaster, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I always try and say to people, I always try and say to young men, you have to identify the logical disconnect between what the Me Too movement is saying in terms of male sexuality and what women actually want from men. Women want confident, strong, typically alpha men. That is what they want. That's the ideal. So when you read about the Me Too movement and it's saying that men should be more passive, men should be you know, more like feminists, Men should be more emotional and cry and all this kind of stuff. Seriously, take it with a pinch of salt. You know, e evolution ha has a better track record than, than feminists and facts and, uh, and their theories is on men and women. So, uh, so, so really, you know, don't take it too seriously. I mean, listen, if, if I have a son and he's being told to, to cry all the time and to not have any confidence, he's, he's going to end up very lonely. Let's just put it that way. So if I had a son, I would, I would put him right and tell him to do the exact opposite because that's what women want anyway. Everybody knows it. It's a fact. No amount of indoctrination can remove basic biological urges and natural inclinations way of behaving that have been set in stone ever since the human race existed. That's, you can't change that by arguing that everything's a social construct. Now let's move on though. We're, we're talking about the book, um, Stand By Your Manhood, in which there's a chapter about male circumcision. Now, I knew that male circumcision was kind of pointless, but I didn't know it was actually dangerous to, to a great extent. And I tweeted about this recently, you know, that, it, that you could make the argument that it's on a par with FGM. I got absolutely, you know, hundreds of responses, people jumping down my throat claiming there's oh, no this. comparison, no comparison to female genital mutilation whatsoever. Is that really the case from your research? That's total BS. I don't care whether people like it or not, but there is a continuum of FGM and the male equivalent is absolutely on there. I don't care whether you like this or not, but genital integrity is equally important for boys as it is for girls. And if you're performing an unnecessary operation on a child's genitals for vanity or for religion, or because you think it's cleaner, which is the most ridiculous excuse of them all, then you're seriously at fault and you need to rethink this whole process on circum your whole thought process on circumcision. Because I've spoken to so many men who've not only been psychologically scarred by the process, but have been left physically reduced. I mean, the whole purpose of male circumcision, removing the head of the, 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 the head of the foreskin. Is, is to desensitize the penis. It was, it was designed to kind of tame lust in the young, uh, you know, and make, uh, you know, teenagers more kind of God-fearing and committed to work and, you know, the Bible, etc. cetera. Um, and so it was designed to dry out the head of the penis, which is exactly what it does to varying degrees with different men. And it creates a lack of sensitivity. And, you know, that is not an accident, it's by design. So when you're performing this completely barbaric practice on young boys, I mean, they may survive, they may be happy with the result at the end, but you are risking huge life-changing, uh, you, you know, uh, consequences. I mean, sometimes boys die from circumcision. You know, there are botched cases of botched circumcisions where boys bleed to death or where the penis can be completely uh, deformed as a result. Sometimes they take off too much foreskin and then that's almost impossible to repair. It, it, there are just so many issues with this, but the most pertinent of them all is that you should not be violating a boy's right to genital integrity. If he wants, if at 18 years of age, he wants to circumcise himself with a broken wine bottle, do you know what? More power to you, you do whatever you want, but nobody should be forcing that issue, that experience on boys, just like nobody should be forcing FGM on girls. And it drives me mad that the narrative about FGM, I mean, even like the acronym FGM, 
female genital mutilation? Why don't we call it genital mutilation? Why are we only arguing for the protection of girls? Why are boys left out in the cold yet again? Uh, so, you know, it's not an issue that I've personally had an experience of. I mean, I don't want to re reveal too much information here, but I am, you know, I am not circumcised. But it's something I'm really passionately believe in because I, I've spoken to so many men and also so many mothers who have regretted circumcising their son because when he's got older and he's had sex, you know, he's realized that it isn't necessarily as pleasurable. He doesn't have as much sensation. He feels violated uh, and he feels, you know, to some degree deformed. And you think, why would you do that when it's completely unnecessary? And I'm looking at some stats here. In 2013, Centers, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported 80.5% of American males aged 14 to 59 years old from 2005 to 2010 were circumcised. So I, from what I remember, it's a majority of males generally in the United States are circumcised. It's less than that mm. in the United Kingdom. But it, there's, even when the, the family isn't religious, they're not even doing it for religious reasons. Now it's just like, oh, that's just the done thing to do, right? That's just normally what people do. They're, like they're, they're, There's no reason for it whatsoever, not even some BS religious reason at, at this point. And as he said, it serves absolutely no purpose whatsoever. It's dangerous. There are these bizarre cultural practices associated with it in certain religions, like Jewish rabbis literally, and this is explicit, but this is what they do. They literally suck off the foreskin when the when the baby has it has it cut off, right? Unbelievable. Do, right? You wouldn't believe. Yeah. So when I wrote when I wrote the chapter of the book about circumcision, I mean I knew I knew quite a lot about the process, but I I didn't realize quite how barbaric and brutal it is. And unbelievably, this practice takes place on the NHS in Great Britain. So taxpayers are funding the circumcision of their sons. It's outrageous. It's unbelievable. And this would not be tolerated if it were happening to girls. And so I always, you know, why is there uh, an inconsistent principle here? Why aren't we protecting all children equally. You know, I mean, it's not rocket science, right? I mean, am I missing something? No, it's it's male genital mutilation, and that's what we should call it. There is a continuum. There, there is a comparison. It's just a fact, and we need to face up to it. And we need to, thankfully, I think in your in your book you talk about how the numbers in America have gradually come down over the past five to ten years. So it, it is losing uh, a, a pre appeal and approval. And thank God for that. But yeah, we need to talk about it in the same context as FGM. Let's talk I mean, about the male. Of, yeah, go ahead. Of, uh, sorry, just, just, just quickly. Some cases of FGM are actually just a pinprick. I mean, I say just, that's still bad enough. Um, but you, know, you, have to, you have to compare it accurately. A pinprick on a, on a girl's vagina is not the same. It's still a violation, but it is not the same as a boy having his entire foreskin involuntarily removed. It's not the same. And I'm sorry, I'm willing to debate this with anybody who disagrees, but it is, it, it is not the same. So to, to deny that there is a link and a correlation between FGM and boy circumcision is just a boss from reality, I'm afraid. It's incredible, given the reaction to that tweet, the amount of people just don't know it and deny that there is any kind of comparison. Whereas he said, in, in some cases, it's even worse. Let's move on to the male pill, though, now, because this is another subject you cover in your book. I'm talking about temporary sterilization of man, which is easily reversible. Right. They've got the technology to do it. Yeah, yeah, they've got it's 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 out there. They can do it. It's not that hard to do from what I read in your book. If so, why is it not on the market? Why is it not available to men? That's a very good question. I actually, as part of my research for the book, I went up to uh, a scientific lab in, in Scotland and I met with a researcher who was leading a team of scientists into male contraception. And you know, he was saying that actually there are several, sets, you know, several scientists all around the world who are on the brink of a huge breakthrough in terms of, of, of male contraception, which, mark my words, will be an absolute game changer when it hits the market. If the female pill created the first half of the sexual revolution, the male pill will finish it off the job um, because it will finally give men, you know, the, the control over the outcome of their of, of their sexual encounters, which is currently women decide when men become fathers. How insane is that? Men, men should be deciding when they become fathers, not women. Um, but the reason it's not on the market is, of course, surprise, surprise, politics. 
there was uh, there's been fierce resistance to, to kind of men having power and control uh, over their own reproduction. Uh, and in the 70s, there was a case where I think he was a Mexican scientist. He came up with a prototype for a male contraceptive, which essentially it was completely reversible and safe. And what it did was it turned off the production of sperm temporarily. Uh, and he presented it to a seminar at the World Health Organization, I believe. And during this presentation, a group of rabid feminists waving placards and screaming like banshees ran into the conference center uh, and, you know, created a complete standoff and, and, and you know, and shut down the presentation. Uh, and as a result, backers, you know, got, got apprehensive and they said, look, the climate isn't right to try and introduce this product. So we, we could have had a male pill several decades ago, but there's been so much political resistance about it that that's why it's not on the market. But I predict in all lifetimes, we will see something and it will be absolutely fantastic when it happens because, you know, I, I'm so sick of hearing stories of, of men having sex with women. I mean, there's one terrifying story that, that I do want to share and it's such, it's surprisingly common. Uh, I, I was speaking to a woman once who admitted that she joined Tinder because not because she wanted a date or a boyfriend, but because she wanted a baby. And so what she was doing was she was getting condoms and she was piercing them with a pin. And then she was, you know, having, having say, it sounds nuts, right? It sounds like a complete conspiracy theory. And I was kind of slack-jawed when this woman was telling me, but it was true. And she was very brazen about it. She was like, oh yeah, look, I really wanted a baby. And I, I couldn't afford to go to a sperm bank. So I was sleeping with these guys, piercing the condom with a pin, then getting pregnant. And then the great thing is that afterwards when I'm pregnant, I can call the CSA and get child support for 18 years. ka -ching. You think, <laughs> right, okay. This, this is a terrifying marketplace for men to operate in sexually. So for them to be given the opportunity to control their sperm production and whether they become fathers is a wonderful thing. And not least because guys, you're gonna be able to have so much consequence free sex embrace it <laughs> well it's like d be responsible for bringing your own condoms <laughs> as well it's pretty basic and when you've finished with the condom dispose of it very quickly that's just basic common sense but zooming out Peter, well, you know yeah yeah zooming out i just want to talk about feminism in general mentioned it earlier this term feminism has t been discredited to some extent in the culture polls show fewer and fewer women identifying as feminists where do you think we stand culturally is it on the wane? Is it on the decline? Or is the, the gender studies indoctrination revolution happening in the schools and colleges still winning out? Or do you see do you see common sense prevailing in terms of, you know, extreme third wave feminism versus justice and fairness and genuine equality for the sexes? How do you see it going? Uh, I kind of consider feminism as a wounded beast. And there's nothing more determined to survive than a wounded beast. And uh, I think that's what we're witnessing now with, with the kind of hysteria that is happening, you know, with feminism, especially when it manifests on social media. You just see how ridiculous it's getting, especially, you know, in the shadow of, of some of the kind of mistreatment of women in the developing world. Um, do I think that it's on the wane? Unfortunately, not. The, uh, you know, facts and truth unfortunately are drowned out by the kind of shrill narrative around feminism and what a lot of people need to realize and accept is that you know the media is populated heavily with feminists who are controlling what they hear and are controlling the message and academics are regularly controlling the curriculum I mean, women's studies classes are a case in point they, they have no academic rigor whatsoever these are just designed to indoctrinate a fresh wave of students every year so that every time these graduates enter the marketplace they're all like Stepford feminists and they've all got the same viewpoint about men and women. Uh, and so unfortunately, while those, you know, while the media is still so biased and when universities are still promoting this political ideology, and it is, it is political, you know, it's, it, I think someone said feminism was Marxism in, in knickers, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, but it, it's going to continue. Uh, and with the birth of social media, it's, it, it just seems to be coming fashionable again, which I think is worrying. Um, so, and that's really why I wrote the book because I wanted it to be a tonic for, for, for men and for boys. Uh, you know, in a world where they're surrounded by all this man hating, it's exhausting. I wanted them to have a bit of a space, you know, 330 pages where they could just go and have a break from it all and fortify themselves and feel a bit reassured. And it's it's a great book, but again, yeah, I get a lot of messages from 
kids in, in, in school, in colleges who are rebelling against that. They see feminism, they see social justice as being very puritanical, very boring, and they see account the rebellion against that as edgy, as the true avant-garde. So that's a positive perspective from, from how I see it. But just tell us in the final minute here how people can get the book and the uh, new project that you've got in the pipeline. Yeah, so the book is available on, on Amazon. You can get it in paperback and, and on Kindle. Uh, and I've just signed up with a new literary agent. He's the same agent as Douglas Murray, who wrote an incredible book. You probably know it called The Strange Death of Europe. Uh, so we're working on a new project now, just finalizing who the publisher is going to be. It's going to be in a similar vein to Stand By Your Manhood, but broadened out slightly. Um, and uh, if people want to find me, uh, they can follow me on Twitter. And I've also just launched a Patreon. So uh, can, they can consider that my tips jar. If, if they like what I do and they'd like me to continue, feel free to throw in some loose change. OK, we'll leave it there, Peter. The book is Stand By Your Manhood. It's excellent. Everybody should go and get it right now. And Peter, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Paul. Pleasure. Please click the big red button to subscribe. It really helps me when you do that. And click the bell to allow notifications so you never miss a new video.